Welcome back to part two of finding your most problematic, troublesome genetic SNPs for your health and now what to do about it. If you haven't yet watched part one, in which I show how to access your raw genetic data from apps like 23andMe or Ancestry.com, you may want to head over to our channel at youtube.com forward slash Keto Naturopath and watch that. Now let's get started. Why would I care about going, why do you need to know about your genes anyway? Well, now I'm gonna take you to lab work, right? So basic lab work, like you went into your doctor, he probably doesn't order half the stuff that I order, but you're gonna to go to the doctor, you're gonna to go to Quest or LabCorp. This is a LabCorp. Most of my uh, clients now go to LabCorp. They used to go to Quest. Um, some of the tests are cheaper at LabCorp and I can order them for them. But what I did is I sorted out about 20 people here, very, different genders and different ages by a lot. And I sorted by homocysteine, highest here, lowest there. I wanna see if other labs correlate with this. Are there other big factors that correlate? So I told you homocysteine briefly, I'm not gonna get into this. This isn't a homocysteine report. This is basically saying do this because those genes are gonna affect these numbers here, right? And there'd be something you can do about it. So, okay, what do we find with the highest homocysteine? And anything over really seven at maximum, I would say five, there's your sweet spot is five to seven. It ends up being a neurotoxin. So homocysteine in your blood ends up being a neurotoxin. And yes, it's associated with dementia, all sorts of neurological issues, uh, Alzheimer's for sure. And uh, we'll go on. So anyway, highest here, lowest there. What else correlates? We find the omega-6-3 ratio, which has nothing to do with homocysteine. That's a fat you get through fish, we think. Well, we know we get it through fish, but there's a connection. So they're pretty much a really pretty good correlation. Not perfect, right? The ratio that you want one to one, omega-6 to omega-3, is 17 to one. Clearly terrible. You go down to here, it's five, whatever, to one. So clearly much better. So now this is just an omega-3. How does omega-3, the lowest omega-3, which is bad, and you wanna get it up to eight ideally. So the lowest is here and the highest is here. So that's kind of saying the same thing. Why is that relevant? Because the omega-3 ratio, this is your chances of having a heart incident, a heart attack, are very high. So they're high, but so what are the high ones? High homocysteine, high omega-6-3, uh, low omega-3, of course that makes sense, and a high risk of heart attack. So you go high and you can see the risk gets lower. It's not perfect but it gets very, there's a low, 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 there's a correlation. What about with, this is insulin resistance. It's a similar, but not perfect, right? Because that's a pretty high insulin resistance, but you, there's more low down here by very low and more high up here. And then insulin in general, higher numbers here, 26, 52, and for the most part, much lower, but not perfect. What else can we say? Your, your inflammation is pretty much associated. One thing I found was really interesting is your hemoglobin, one AC, pretty much correlated pretty pretty evenly. You want it under 5.7 for sure, ideally into the fours and low fives, but um, not perfect, but there was a correlation there too. And you can look at other things, triglycerides over HDL and blah, blah, blah. But let's look, I've just been telling you, ranting on about, wait a minute, homocysteine in your genome, uh, B12, folate, choline. Now let's look at intercellular. And I also said there's no test blood work that you can get done from a doctor's office. You can't get it from me either. So where I go is an intercellular test company, SpectraCell. There's no big secret there, but look at this. So what I did is I, for clients, I put in all the numbers down here and either I forgot to put in these numbers that that's unfortunate for this. But what I want to point out is these are deficiencies. These are borderline deficiencies. And what do we find? Folate, intracellular. So that's white blood cell. It's an intralymphocyte test. It's not your serum. It's intracellular. Folate, B12, choline, B12. B2, I should have pointed out too, is very much part of all this. When I go back, I'll show you again. So choline, folate, B12, B2. And when you go down here, that's not so much there's copper, you know, other deficiencies, but it's not about that. So there's a correlation is what I'm saying. We're tightening it up. And here's the last little coup de grace, so to say. And that is that 
You know, there's a lot of research going on in the UK primarily on supplements for Alzheimer's. Supplements for Alzheimer's. What they found is folate, B12, B6, B2, and omega-3. Low omega-3 and these other deficiencies had a high probability of Alzheimer's and dementia. This is exactly what we're finding. Low omega-3, high homocysteine, which basically means you're deficient in these other things. So you're seeing a pattern? This is why I'm encouraging you to roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, find out about this. This isn't a big expense. This is going to take a little headspace more. It's going to take pocket space. I covered a lot of this about what was what I've just mentioned in Alzheimer's and the B vitamins and the omega-3 here pretty thoroughly. So um, I'll put the link above, but it's the new face of Alzheimer's and it's a big deal. And that, and we go into a uh, ketogenic diet and of course ketones versus glucose, but they go together. Uh, in this country, everybody's about keto, which is good. I don't know about keto, but if you don't look to vitamin deficiency, specifically B vitamins and omega-3, you know, you are bailing water out of a, a, a boat that has a hole in it. So here's what other ones look like. So when you go to your report, my report, here's folate, and it goes, oh, I don't know, under, understand all this stuff. It's right. Well, I'm going to show you. This is a concerning, notice purple, purple, purple. Uh, this has to do not only with making B methylfolate, which I've told you about. So methylfolate makes up 80% of your blood folate. In your blood, if I was to take your blood right now, whoosh, take it out, and it would make up 80%. Um, and if you can't make methylfolate, you are up a frickin' tree. And so I am one of those people that being very slow in doing that is a problem for me. And so that's associated with certainly the spectrum disorders. So you have dyslexia on one side and you have autism on the other and you have lots of things in the middle like Asperger's and, and so on. And so this is something that can be addressed. How do you address something like this? You look for it for one, you then apply the appropriate food that contains those nutrients and more than likely various supplements to get that. So if we all had a really nutritious diet, these issues would not be there. They'd be taken care of. Here's choline snips. And this is from a way back in 2006 when they were kind of just breaking the ice on how important this was. And these are all the snips. I just showed you this one and PEMT. I showed you that a little while ago. These are all the SNPs that really make for a very difficult uh, ability to produce enough acetylcholine, uh, phosphatidylcholine. And so therefore, people that have this problem are going to have muscle problems, they're going to have brain problems, neurotransmitter problems, and they're probably going to have liver problems. Covered on, on, on other videos. Okay, so some of the problems with PEMP mutations, the ones that I have, for instance, and this is, where's the one? That's the one I just looked up. This TT variant is approximately 30% lower function of that gene. And also this other one, oh, I don't have this other one, thank goodness, but I'll show you somebody who does. It's really impactful for women. And I'm going to continue this on another uh, video is that women need to have high choline for most of their premenopausal years, for most of their cycling years. And so what's the problem? So for premenopausal women, this particular mutation may may not experience the benefit of enhanced PEMT function during reproductive years. What the heck is that? Here's what that's about. In the reproductive years, they have much higher estrogen and then it goes down to postmenopause and getting older. So what does that have to do with it? Estrogen drives, activates, induces, forces forward very rapidly the PEMT gene that helps make choline to all the things that we need, acetylcholine, phosphatidylcholine, right? Well, if that gene is plugged up, it doesn't matter how much estrogen you have. So this was kind of the, the gift, if you will, of being female by having all this estrogen that's going to drive that particular function, and they're going to have great brain space. Well, if this is a problem, they're not going to get that. They're going to be just like a guy, <laughs> so to say, not completely. So estrogen induces the PEMT to convert choline into acetylcholine and phosphatidylcholine. It's both vital for brain muscle and liver function. In addition to, this is the prevalence of depression of women during estrogen, when their estrogen's high. Why would that be? It's because they have a non-functioning or very low functioning PEMT. They can't make the benefit of having, so really it's, they're not getting the choline they need and they need to have it through diet. And we were never told to have it through diet. So they are deficient through a very important part of their life. And um, that's why the bouts of depression 
or during their reproductive years. All right, this is s methanolthiamine Some people know it as, as a depression disorder treatment. It's a supplement, but these are just, these are other choline SNPs, pH, you saw that on that list, uh, BHMT, um, CHDA, they're all numbers, right? There's your PEMT. So just know it's purple, purple, purple. There's a problem. Houston, we got a problem. So this is all about converting homocysteine back to methionine to keep it low, right? It's going to be seven or low, or otherwise it becomes a toxic in your bloodstream, a neurotoxic, neurotoxin. So there's a lot of details to go through, but it provides a lot of good information. All right, here's what I did with my, so now that I knew that I had these uh, mutations, I put them back through the raw data, and sure enough, it showed up. There's that gene. Yep, got that mutation. There is the two pimped ones, two pimped mutations I did have, actually, I thought. And so there's there and there. So that's how it shows up on your raw data. So you have to really do a lot of work on that. You can do it. So I'm saying it's doable. Start there, get your hands dirty. It's free if you've already done 23andMe. Okay, again, back to this. These are, you know, these are those SNPs that we we're just talking about. Okay, so coming up ne next, and this is kind of where we're leading to, is why women gain weight after menopause, and it really is a thing. It's not imaginary. Some women absolutely do, and it has to do with what we just talked about. And why do they have twice the incidence of dementia and al Alzheimer's than men? And what to do about it. So we're going to go the why and the how, and then what to do about it. Till next time. So the idea of going over your genes in your labs, and now that you know how to get your raw data out of your 23andMe or Ancestry.com and download it, is that you look at the things that were your weaknesses, your greatest vulnerabilities. Um, they can be fixed and they can be addressed. That's, that's why you're doing this. this. There's something you can do about it. It isn't, oh me, I have a terrible gene and I'm, my life is faded. You're, no, it's not faded. What's faded is your effort to apply some knowledge. You don't have to be a super specialist, but to get involved and understand this and don't feel you're sw swimming in a sea of too many variables and I can't do this and can't do that. Confusion is a state. Let curiosity lead you to understanding some of these things. Um, it's kind of like this fig tree. I have no idea what we're going to do with it because we don't really eat figs, but it's pretty remarkable. They're so darn fruitful. Till next time. So if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you'd want to do it, various topics, as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.